Okay, good morning and welcome back to our Tuesday morning Bible class here from Bethlehem Lutheran Church in Menominee Falls in Germantown, Wisconsin. As we uh, bring to a close, after a little over a year of doing these Tuesday morning studies online, we're going to bring to a close our uh, Tuesday morning online studies as we uh, bring our study of the life of Abraham to a close. We're going to be looking at Genesis chapter 22. If you like to follow along in your Bibles, that's where we'll be starting is Genesis 22. Um, and if uh, if you like to follow along in the study and discussion guide, then the one was posted in the Facebook feed right beneath uh, right beneath this video. You should be able to find a link to the study guide called the Climax of Abraham's Faith. And this is um, in in many ways this is the end of the Abraham story. There are a couple little details um, about Abraham that that are a part of the Isaac and Jacob story, but uh, but in terms of the the story, the, the the narrative of Abraham's life, this is really the the climax. This is the end point. This is the the thing to which the whole the whole thing builds. Um, and so, uh, what this what we'd like to do today is to cover verses t uh, chapter twenty two and to kind of look at this climax of Abraham's faith. Um, the final test of Abraham's faith to see just how far he's come in his faith. Um, so what we'll do is we'll begin a prayer and then we'll talk, we'll kind of set the scene a little bit um, uh, about uh, what led up, the events that led up to this test. And then we'll launch into the, to the section, which is uh, Genesis chapter 22. But let's begin with prayer. So we pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, you have called us to be on a journey with you. A journey through this life in which we trust in you and in your promises, rely on your presence and, and your power, and we ask that you would be with us as we study your word this morning, that you would help us to see your great love for us, the great promises that you have made and fulfilled, uh, and that though there are some that are yet to be fulfilled, we can be certain that you will bring them to completion just as you have brought about the promise to win our salvation through Jesus. We ask this in all things in his holy name. Amen. Okay, so just a real brief reminder of where we left off last week. So where we left off last week was with two kind of monumental events in the life of Abraham. Um, one was what we might call geopolitical, and then one was more limited to his family. But the geopolitical uh, uh, place where he left off is that he, that Abraham makes this covenant with Abimelech and Phicol, the commander of Abimelech's armies, and that he is going to live in the area of Philistia um, and in the, in the land of Gerar, and he's going to live as a foreigner there, and he's going to have good relationships with the with uh, foreigners around him, so that you know, from a from an outward you know perspective, from from the perspective of where he's living, um, he is at peace. Abraham's at peace where he's at because he has this kind of permanent home in which to dwell now. Okay, so um, I shouldn't say a permanent home, but he's got a he's got a stable place in which to dwell. He's not going to be a a wanderer anymore. He's gonna he's gonna have this. Um, home base, so to speak, from which to dwell. So his his outward situation is at peace. He's at peace with the with the the area in which he lives. Um, I'm getting a, a note from Barb that says there's no stream. The fact that you're commenting on the stream means that there should be. Um, and if if you are able to make the stream work, if you could please just let me know. Send me a note. Um, that lets, lets me know that it's coming through. My guess is maybe you can just, buy, if you just refresh your refresh your uh, browser or something like that, maybe um, close Facebook and bring it back up. You should be able to make it work. Um, but the fact that you're commenting on the stream makes it makes makes it seem like there would be a stream for for there to be for there to be commenting on. Um, <clears throat> Um, so that was the the outward situation, the um, the external situation. The the problem that he had is 
All right, uh, peace that he has is that he is, he's now at peace with Bimelech and, and Phicol, the commander of Bimelech's armies. And then within his own household, um, there's peace. There had been tension between Ishmael and Isaac. Um, Ishmael had been, um, Ishmael had been uh, persecuting Isaac. She's got a note from Gwen that the, that the stream is working. So the stream is okay. Um, should maybe... Like I said, maybe just um, Jim and Barb, just try refreshing your screen or uh, your your browser, or leaving Facebook and coming back to it. It should um, sh should be able to connect to it. Everything seems to be working from our end, though. Um, and from Abraham's from Abraham's household perspective, there had been tension or persecution between Ishmael and, I and Isaac. Remember, Isaac is the one through whom the, the promise is going to be reckoned. He's the one through whom the Messianic promise is going to be fulfilled. And so God um, tells Abraham to go ahead and send um, Ishmael and Hagar away. And God um, takes care of Ishmael and Hagar for the sake of Abraham. But now there is peace within Abraham's household. So there is peace outside the household as he's settled in the land of Philistia, the area of Gerar, um, at the... Um, with the permission of Abimelech. Um, and there's peace within Abraham's household um, because he sent away Ishmael and Hagar. And now Isaac is the unchallenged heir of Abraham. And uh, and so everything's at peace. Finally, after all these chapters, and we're going back all the way to, to chapter 12, to the call of Abraham, it's kind of been one thing after another, one conflict after another. Um, and and now finally everything seems to kind of be at peace. Everything seems to um, have come to to a rest. Everything seems to be going well. And it's in the midst of this seeming peace, this in the midst of this seeming um, prosperity, that the Lord is going to suddenly appear in chapter 22 with an unthinkable command, um, with the command to slay Isaac. Um, and this is the kind of the ultimate test of Abram's faith. So if we go ahead and look at our look at our sheet, um, this is lesson nine, the climax of faith, Genesis twenty-two chapters or ch chapter twenty-two verses one through twenty-four. Um, and we're going to begin by looking at these two passages. So we've got this passage, this very important passage from James chapter one. Um, I make my catechism kids memorize this passage. Um, when we uh, when we get to the sixth petition of the Lord's Prayer, lead us not into temptation. Um, this, this passage reminds us that when tempted, no one should say God is tempting me. Um, should be God is tempting me, um, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does He tempt anyone. So this passage very clearly tells us that God is not the author of temptation. That God does not tempt us. God does not tempt people. But then we have at the beginning of chapter 22, we have this phrase, sometime later, God tested Abraham. And I guess what I'm trying to draw a connection or draw a, a distinction or to, uh, um, a, 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 to contrast or compare and contrast the words tempt and test. Um, and so I asked the question, what's the difference between a temptation and a test? Well, I think the difference has to do with what, what, what is the ultimate goal you're trying to get at with that temptation or test? Is, it, uh, is, it, is the goal to lead someone to fail or is it to lead someone to, to succeed? If, if you're, if you're, if you're putting an obstacle in someone's way in order to lead them to fail, with the express purpose of them failing, then I think you can rightly call that temptation. And the Bible says that God doesn't ever tempt. Um, God doesn't put temptations in our paths, in believers' paths. Um, he, doesn't, he doesn't put stumbling blocks in our paths so that we will trip up in our faith. Um, he, he doesn't put us in situations to fail. Um, that doesn't mean that he doesn't allow difficulties and hardships to come into our life, though. But those difficulties and hardships are not intended to lead us to fail, but lead us to succeed. I think that's the difference between a temptation and a test. 
A temptation is a hardship or difficulty that God puts into our path with a purpose, or that someone puts into our path with the purpose of leading us to stumble in our faith. A test is a hardship or a difficulty that God puts in our path that leads us to grow in our faith, um, or that helps us show that there has been growth in our faith. And this is where I think we're, um, this is what we're trying to get at with this. Um, with this idea of testing or tempting the faith of Abraham. It wasn't that that God was tempting Abraham by commanding him to slay Isaac. It was a test of Abraham's faith. It's not for God's sake. God doesn't need to know whether or not God, Abraham loves him more than he loves Isaac. God knows everything. He already knows what is in Abraham's heart. He knows Abraham's heart better than Abraham does. Um, the point of the test is for Abraham to learn something about his relationship with God. Okay, so um, so we don't want to say this is a test. We don't want or attempt. Uh, we don't want to say this is a tempting. Um, this is not God tempting Ab Abraham. This is not God trying to get Abraham to slip up or to fail in his faith. <clears throat> Another way of saying this is, God knows ahead of time that Abraham is going to pass this test. That's why God allows the test to come into his life when and, and where he does. Because he's reached a place in his faith where he is, his faith is matured and he is able to, um, to pass. He's able to succeed in this test um, of whether or not who does he love more. Does he love God more or does he love Isaac more? And then, you know, just how does remembering this help important difference help frame what happens in Genesis 22? There are a lot of... A lot of people, especially negative scholars, negative critics, that see in this story kind of an evil God. You know, a God that um, that delights in um, doing mean things to his children. Um, uh, uh, that delights in, uh, you know, commanding that, his, that, his, that Abraham do something that kind of goes against uh, what... Uh, what we know is in God's character. And so um, there's lots of uh, 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 very nasty things that's said about this section of Scripture by those who have a low view of Scripture um, and uh, about what God is doing to Abraham. Um, and, and we don't need to think that. This isn't, this isn't a bad thing that God is doing. This is a, a gift that God is giving to Abraham that, that through this testing, through this um, opportunity to 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 see the strength of his faith. Abraham is going is going to learn something about just how far God has brought him um, as one of the people of God, as the as the great ancestor or forerunner of the Messiah. Okay. All right. So, um, with that in mind, let's go ahead and look at the text. So let's look at the test itself. This is chapter twenty-two, verses one and two. Sometime later. God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, Abraham replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. So number one, what factors make God's command in chapter 2 especially difficult for Abraham? Well, um, first of all, let's just think about um, the fact that what God is asking for is a human sacrifice, which we know clearly from Scripture, repeatedly from Scripture, is not God-pleasing. In fact, it's, it's more than not God-pleasing. God hates human sacrifice. Um, God... Um, God ex explicit, repeatedly and explicitly forbids human sacrifice. Um, and so God is, um, so the first kind of difficulty here is that God is asking Abraham to do something that goes against the express will of God, that goes against what God has revealed about himself as a God that despises human sacrifice. Um, and then, of course, the other thing is, just think about all that has happened to get us to this place, to get us to where we have Isaac, the call 
to leave the the land that got that um, that he had grown up in, the Ur of the Chaldeans, and go to the land that God would show him. And then you got the whole um, the whole thing with uh, lying about Sarah in Egypt, and then you got the whole thing with rescuing Lot and the four kings against the five kings, and you've got the whole Sodom and Gomorrah um, incident, and and you've got. Um, you know, just just one thing after another, the whole Hagar and Ishmael debacle. Um, one thing after another, one um, one up and one down after another. We've, we've talked about Abraham's faith as being like a roller coaster, you know, where it has all these ups and all these downs. And we've gone through all these things to get to this place, to get to the, the child of the promise, the, the one through whom... Um, the, the messianic promise is going to be reckoned. Remember that God had said to Abraham that it is through Isaac that your nation, that your offspring will be reckoned. Um, and so uh, this, is, this is the guy. This is the child. This is the, 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 the person through whom all of God's promises are going to be fulfilled. And now you have God commanding Abraham to sacrifice him, to slay him, to kill him. You know, how how can that how can God's promises be fulfilled if God's command is to slay the one through whom the promises are going to be fulfilled? It seems to be Luther talks about in his commentary on this section. He talks about how the command and promises of God seem to be in contrast with each other. But you've got the promises of God that says that all of this is going to happen through Isaac. Now you got the command of God that's saying you got to sacrifice Isaac. How can it be that the command of God and the promise of God are at odds? Um, and that's what makes this this command so difficult, so you know, kind of mind-bogglingly difficult for Abraham. And and even the wording of the command emphasizes the difficulty. Um, and so, so it says, uh, "Take your son." Okay, take your son and buy and, and remember your only son. Now remember that he does have another son. He has Ishmael, but Ishmael has been sent away, so and he's not he's not coming back. There's no there's no bringing Ishmael back at this point. So Isaac is in a sense and in, in a real sense, um, Ish, uh, um, Abraham's only son. So your son, your only son. Your son whom you love, this is what this whole test is really about. Whom do you love more? Do you love Isaac more or do you love me more? God, do you love God more? Do you love the gift or do you love the giver of the gift more? Right? And then he names him Isaac. Remember the significance of that name? He laughed. Um, that was um, so significant because that's how Abraham and Sarah respond at the news that they're going to receive a, a child in their old age. They both laugh, one in faith and one in unbelief. And so one of the um, illustrations that I've heard is if, you know, if the command to sacrifice Isaac is like, is like sticking a knife in Abraham, then every one of these phrases is like twisting that knife. So, you know, sacrifice your son, your only son, the son whom you love, Isaac. Um, it just every little every little word, every little phrase that gets added to the command is like a little twist of the knife in Abraham's back to emphasize just how difficult a command this is going to be to fulfill. How um, how um, how contrary to everything that Abraham knows and wants is going to happen. Um, that, that this is the child of the promise. This is his beloved son. Um, and uh, and God is now commanding that he be sacrificed. Um, Ab Abraham is being his faith is being tested. Who do you love more? Whom does Abraham love more? Does he love God more? Is he willing to carry out God's command, even when that command requires him to sacrifice his son, or does he love his son more than God, and so and would be unwilling to sacrifice his son even though God commands it. That's kind of what's at stake. That's the that's the test, right? That's what make that's the difficulty that makes this a test. So you've got the the difficulty of the command being you know think of all that that it's taken to get to this point to get to Isaac to get to 
having things finally be settled down and at peace. Finally, Abraham is, can kind of just sit back and enjoy life because everything is finally in place. And now God upset, upsets that peace. He upsets that settledness with his command. Um, and then even the wording of the command, sacrifice your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac. Every one of those little modifiers, every one of those phrases just continues to emphasize again and again how difficult um, uh, this this carrying out this task is going to be for Abraham. Okay? All right, so let's look at how he responds to this command, Abraham's response. Chap uh, chapter 22, verses 3 to 5. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, this is important, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. All right, so number two. What aspect of Abraham's faith, which we've seen repeatedly before, is emphasized with the opening words of verse 3. So verse 3, we have those words, early the next morning. Um, so once again, we have this um, aspect of Abraham's faith that is his immediate willingness to obey difficult commands. We would understand, I think everybody would have understood if Abraham had said, okay, yeah, God, I will do this. I'll do this thing that you ask, but maybe I'll do it at the beginning of next week. Right? You know, I've got important stuff to do this week. I've, my calendar is already filled up, um, but um, but I will get to it. I will get to sacrificing Isaac. But that's not Abraham's response. Um, he drops everything. God commands, and and Abraham immediately obeys. We saw this um, this same thing happen with the call to go to the land that God would show him. Right? Scott is, he doesn't even know where he's going yet, but he drops everything and starts heading in the direction that God was leading him. We saw it when God gave him the covenant of circumcision. Um, the early the next morning, he gets up and circumcises himself and Ishmael and his entire household. We saw it last week when we, uh, when we heard the command to send Ishmael and Hagar away very early the next morning. Um, he's, he does this very difficult thing of sending away the son that he loves. And now, you know, kind of the climax of that, you've got Abraham being called to sacrifice Isaac, and very early the next morning, he gets up and he carry, and he goes to carry out that command. Um, so there's no hesitation on his part. There's no, you know, kind of hemming and hawing. There's no, um, you know, stalling on Abraham's part. Um, he... Um, he just does what God tells him to do, and he does it immediately. That's a remarkable, remarkable aspect of Abraham's faith. Is this? It's not just his obedience, but the um, the dedication to obeying immediately. It's an aspect of Abraham's faith that we all do well to to emulate. All right, we're on the back of the first page now. So page two, number three. Um, Hebrews 11 verses 17 and 19 gives us an inspired commentary on this event. Um, so remember Hebrews chapter 11 is the, he, is the heroes of faith chapter of the Bible. Um, and it talks about how different Old Testament saints lived by faith and not by sight. And nobody gets more attention in the heroes of faith chapter than does Abraham. Abraham gets more coverage than anybody else in Hebrews chapter 11. And um, in verses 17 and 19 of chapter 11, we actually get this event discussed where God, where God commands that Isaac be sacrificed. And how, um, a, how Abraham handles that as being an example of walking by faith and not by sight. And in those verses, the writer of the Hebrews states that Abraham reasoned that God could raise the dead. So this seems to have been what, I mean, that seems to, according to the New Testament, according to the, the inspired commentary on the Genesis text, um, this is what was going through Abraham's mind. Abraham was saying to himself, God 
has promised that Isaac is the one through whom all of the Messianic promises are going to be fulfilled, are going to be carried out. So if he's going to command that I kill Isaac, then he must, he, he must have a mind to raise Isaac from the dead. Um, that, that's what Abraham reasoned. Abraham had figured, he, had, he, he, had, he was counting or, or um, reckoning in his head. Um, reasoning or reckoning that 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 if he killed Isaac, like God had commanded him to do, then, then God was going to raise him from the dead. And there are some who have suggested that the writer of the Hebrews is reading the story backwards, and that is that he is the writer of the Hebrews is attributing a confidence to Abraham that could only have existed after the event. In other words. Um, there are some negative critics that say what the writer of the Hebrews is doing is saying, um, you know, that na a after after Abraham goes through this whole thing, and, and again, I don't, I hope I'm not spoiling the end of the story for you, but God stops Abraham from sacrificing Isaac. Um, that's you know, kind of the climax of the whole story is when is when God tells him to stop. So that some people that say the writer of the Hebrew, what the writer of Hebrews is doing is saying. Well, you know, after the fact, after Abraham learned exactly what God had in mind, then he took that confidence that he could have had after the fact, and then he's reading it back into the story beforehand. But what I want us to do is to look at how, what the writer says about Abraham's confidence that, um, that God would have raised Isaac from the dead is actually evident in the Genesis text. You don't need the writer of the Hebrews to tell you that. You can actually see that confidence in the Genesis text itself. So I said, look carefully at Abraham's words to his servants in verse 5. How do these words from the Genesis account validate the argument in Hebrews 11? It's kind of a backwards question. It's actually the other way around. How does the Hebrews 11 argument validate the words of Genesis um, chapter 22? But if you look at 22 verse 5, Look at the pronouns. The pronouns are really important. Abraham said to the servants, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there to go over there or over on the mountain. We will worship and then we will come back to you. So now, Abraham knows that the way that he's going to worship God when he goes up on top of the mountain is to sacrifice Isaac. That's what he's been commanded. To go on the top of Mount Moriah and sacrifice his son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac. Right. Um, so, uh, so Abraham knows that the way he's going to go worship God is by sacrificing Isaac. But nevertheless, he tells the servants that he and Isaac are both going to go, and they're both going to come back. So you can see already in the Genesis text that Abraham believes that God is going to raise Isaac from the dead. That he's going to, as far as Abraham knows, he's going to sacrifice Isaac at the top of Mount Moriah, and then God is going to raise Isaac from the dead, and they're both going to go back down to the donkeys and then go back home. That's how Abraham has kind of worked out what seems to be the promise of God and the command of God being at odds. He, he said he he knows that God is a God who can raise the dead. Um, and, so, and and we, we see that even already in the Genesis text with, this, with these words, we will go and worship and we will come back to you. Um, uh, even though he knows that worshiping is going to involve the sacrificing of his son, he nevertheless, um, he nevertheless goes with that confidence that God is going to raise him from the dead. Okay? All right, then the story kind of gets... Um, it gets personal, okay? So, um, verses 6 to 8, I call this the conversation. So we have the command, and then the, the response, Abraham's response, and then here's the conversation. So, um, as they're walking up the mountain, Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed... Oh, sorry, I skipped... Um, no, I, I, this is right. Verses 6 to 8. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied, 
The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. Just a couple of quick questions about this. Um, what does Isaac's question say about the worship life of Abraham's family? So Isaac, who is probably around 12 years old, 12 or 13 years old at this point, we don't, we're not, we don't know exactly because, remember, the section begins some time later, so we don't, we're not told exactly how much, law, how much later um, after the, the weaning um, of the last chapter, but usually we think about, uh, about Isaac as being about 12 or 13 years old when this happens. Uh, you know, he's, not, he's, he's no dummy. He's, he, he recognizes that all the elements of a sacrifice are there, that when you've got a, a knife, a, a knife that you use to slay an animal, and you've got wood and fire that you use to burn an animal to make a burnt offering to the Lord, um, that um, he, he, he knows that they're going to make a sacrifice. He knows that they're walking up the mountain in order to make a sacrifice. And he notices that they've got the wood, and they've got the fire, and they've got the knife, but what they don't have is the sacrificial animal. They don't have the lamb that that would normally be, um, would normally would be uh, uh, um, sacrificed or offered. So, um, obviously, uh, Isaac. Obviously, Abraham's family was a worshiping family. Obviously, Abraham's family was a family where animal sacrifice, where making burnt offerings to the Lord, was a common practice because. Um, because Isaac knows what's going on, he recognizes um, he recognizes all the elements are there to make a sacrifice, um, and and so he he asks this kind of gut wrenching question: Where is the lamb for the sacrifice? And of course, we as as readers know, because we have the beginning of the story, we as readers know that he is the lamb, or that he is. Supposed he's supposed to be the lamb, that he is the sacrificial animal. Uh, he's he is the sacrifice, um, and and so it kind of gut um, gut wrenchingly asks, where is the animal for the sacrifice? Where is the lamb for the sacrifice? And, and Abraham answers, the Lord will provide the lamb. And so I ask the question: Is Abraham's answer in verse eight deceptive? Why or why not? There's some people that have who have accused. Um, Abraham of being of deceiving his son here that he that he should have just told the truth. Um, he should have said, "Well, son, actually, you're going to be the one that we're going to sacrifice." That that's that that's what Abraham should have responded if he was being perfectly truthful, perf you know, perfectly, um, completely uh, forthright about what was going on. He, then he should have should have been there to tell Isaac that he was the one that was going to be sacrificed, but. Um, but I think what we really have, what, I don't think that I don't think we have Abraham being deceptive at all. I think we have another example of Abraham's faith um, on display. You know that Abraham believed, Abraham is confident that God will provide the lamb, that God will provide the sacrifice. Whether that's, as far as he knows, that's going to be Isaac. Um, but he, um, but he, the the point is that he trusts in God. Um, that he trusts in God's providence. He trusts that God will provide. Um, and that's going to kind of become the big takeaway from this story. On this mountain, the Lord will provide. All right. And now the, um, the, the kind of the climax of the story, verses, 19 to, to four, verses 9 to 14. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. I, and I think, I think there's, I think we do well to put a little pause there. So I think in, in Abraham's mind, the deed is done. He's taken up the knife. He. He has every intention of slaying his son. Verse 11. But the angel of the Lord 
called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do, and here's what the angel of the Lord says. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God, because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up, and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, The Lord Will Provide. And to this day it is said, On the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. Um, <clears throat> we can keep going. Verse 15, The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies, and, though, and through your offspring all nations on the earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. Then Abraham returned to his servants, and they set off together to Beersheba, and Abraham stayed in Beersheba. Okay, so, um, maybe I, uh, let's go ahead and look at these questions. So looking at number six, um, who stops Abraham from completing the sacrifice and how do you know? Now, um, so we, obviously the, the, the obvious answer, the, 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 technically the correct answer is the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord is the one who calls but whenever you have, in the Old Testament, you have that phrase, the angel of the Lord, I guess even in the New Testament too, but it really becomes a problem. It really is most often an issue in the Old Testament. When you have that phrase, the angel of the Lord, you have to ask yourself, is it a created angel of the Lord? Is it an angel of the Lord? An angel like the angel Gabriel or the angel Michael? Or is it the angel of the Lord, the capital A angel of the capital L Lord? Um, is it the Lord God himself? And you you know, uh, you can know when um, when the angel of the Lord, the one who speaks as the angel of the Lord, is the Lord himself, when he claims something, when he when he claims divine honor, okay, so when he when he um, when he claims to do something that only God can do, okay? Or when he receives divine honor, when he, when the angel of the Lord allows himself to be worshipped, you know, that's the one true God, because no angel of the Lord, no created angel would allow themselves to be worshipped, only God is to be worshipped. Um, when, in the book of Revelation, when John tries to fall at the feet of an angel, the created angel, the angel stops him and says, don't worship me, I'm just a servant like you, um, only worship God. So if, if the angel claims to do or, or be something that only God can do or be, or if the angel um, is, uh, is addressed or um, worshipped as God, or if the text actually says that the angel of the Lord is the Lord, then we know that it, that it isn't just an angel of the Lord, that it is the angel of the Lord. And in this case, we already know um, from the very first thing that it says, from the very first thing the angel says, um, this is, I'm looking at verse 12. This is chapter 22, verse 12. Do not lay a hand on the boy, the angel said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God, because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Um, Abraham was not sacrificing Isaac to an angel. He was sacrificing Isaac to the Lord. So for this angel to say that, that Abraham was not um, withholding his son from him means that the one who's speaking is himself God. This is the capital A angel of the Lord. This is God himself. This is the Lord God himself who's speaking. And then if there were any question about that, um, it's um, it's settled in verse um, verses 15 and 16. Uh, the angel of the Lord calls to Abraham from a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord. So if there were any question from the first time, that question is you know completely obliterated by the second speaking where the 
angel of the Lord speaks a second time and actually declares himself to be the Lord. So we know that it's God himself who stops um, Abram from sacrificing Isaac. Number seven, bottom of page two, Hebrews 11.19 says, Abraham reasoned that God could raise the dead, and figuratively speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. Um, why did God stop Abraham, and did Abraham pass or fail the test? The, the reason that, that this question is in here is because there are some commentators, some interpreters over the centuries who have said that the reason that God stopped Abraham at that point is because Abraham was about to hesitate. That Abraham didn't really have in mind that he was going to go through with it. And so God stops him before he can fail the test. But I, I think that is just putting a, a really negative spin on the story. Uh, and again, I, that's why I think it's so important for us to, to note at the end of verse 10, that Abraham picks up the knife with every intention of slaying his son. That there, that there, that's a really momentous um, a momentous moment um, in this story. Um, when, he, when he reaches out his hand and he takes the knife to slay his son. In Abraham's mind, the writer of the Hebrews says, in Abraham's mind, um, Isaac was as good as dead. So he really does pass the test. He really is willing to sacrifice Isaac. Um, he really does love God more than Isaac. If he has to choose between obeying God and sparing Isaac, he chooses to obey God. Um, and, and I just think that's you know worth pointing out, worth worth noticing or recognizing um, that uh, that Abraham passes the test. That's why that's why God stops him. Not because he's failed the test, not because he's about to hesitate, not because he's about to withhold his son, but because he's because he passes the test, because he has every intention of slaying Isaac, and that's not what God wants. So he, um, so he he passes the test very 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 much so very much passes, and then we get kind of the fallout of the story or the. The moral of this story, if you want to think about, it, I don't, you know, I don't want to necessarily try to boil the story down to a single moral, but, um, but this, uh, this is not an accident that the story ends with this thing about God providing. So, on um, what principle, which stands at the center of Old Testament Judaism and New Testament Christianity, is illustrated by God's provision of a ram, um, and the principle is that of substitutionary atonement. Um, you know the like our vicarious atonement um, that in or, that a substitute dies in our place that for sin to be paid for a substitute has to take our place so in this case in order for Isaac's life to be spared the ram has to die that's what all of Old Testament Judaism's religion is built around the sacrificial system the 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 substitutionary system where the where the sub the substitutionary animal dies in place of the guilty sinner and of course that all points ahead to him who is the ultimate lamb of god the ultimate substitute who dies on the cross um, to take away the sins of the world so um, this idea that god provides a substitute a substitutionary atonement or um, vicarious atonement is the principle um, around which Old Testament Judaism and New Testament Christianity revolves. Um, is this idea that one uh, a substitute dies in our place, a substitute dies for us? And with that in mind, you know the question we've kind of already answered, number nine: um, What place would we call our on this mountain the Lord will provide. You know, for Abraham, that was Mount Moriah. For us, it's Mount Calvary, right? It's Mount, it's, it's the Mount of the, it's, it's um, the Mount of the Cross. That's where God provides our substitute. Um, that's where um, our substitutionary sacrifice takes place, is at the cross. Jesus takes upon himself 
all of our sins and he is punished for the sins that we have committed his his perfect righteousness his innocence his blessedness his righteousness gets credited to us through faith like the kind of the great exchange idea right that our sins go to Jesus and Jesus righteousness comes to us um, that uh, so that uh, if you want to think you know where is where is our Mount Moriah so to speak our Mount Moriah is the cross that's where God provides for our salvation um, that's where God spares our life um, that's where God provides a substitute for us And then we kind of already read this, but we can uh, we can just finish this up from verses 20 to 24. Um, sometime later, Abraham was told, Milka is also a mother. She has borne sons to your brother Nahor. Uz, the firstborn, Buzz, his brother, Kemuel, the father of Aram. So they're the Aramites. Chesed, Hazo, Pildash, Jilpa, and Bethuel. Bethuel became the father of Rebekah. Milcah bore these eight sons to Abraham's brother Nahor. His concubine, who was named Ruma, also had sons, Teba, Gaham, Tehash, and Maaka. Uh, I'm, re I'm really focused, though, on this question really um, belongs to um, verses 15 through 19. Um, but in, in what sense is the Messianic promise repeated? Well, you've got the, the big elements of the Messianic promise that are repeated, um, you've got that um, the the descendants of Abraham will be as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. You've got the um, the idea of all the offspring of the nations of the earth will be blessed through Abraham. Um, so there's the, there's the messianic promise part, right? So the um, the messianic promises are repeated, but in a sense that promise is expanded upon with this this. Um, this note that your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies. Um, so uh, this is a, already a little hint of the conquest, um, a, a little prophecy of the conquest of the promised land that, um, that God's people will enjoy under Joshua, um, that they will, take, they will take, the, take possession of the cities um, of their enemies. Okay. So with that in mind, that kind of you know t tells the story of a of Abraham and the sacrifice of Isaac. We can talk a, co a couple of discussion questions here to finish up about how we, this maybe kind of applies to our lives today. Um, first of all, we're going to read Matthew ten verses thirty seven to thirty nine, and the question is: In what sense does God provide Abraham test for us every day? This is what Jesus says in Matthew 10. These are the words of Jesus. Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. And of course, the question is, you know, in what sense does God provide Abraham's test for us every day? Well, remember the whole the whole purpose of a test, the whole question of a test of Abraham's faith is who do you love most, Abraham? Um, whom who, who is the who is the ultimate um, good in your life? Is it God? Is it the giver of the gifts, or is it Isaac, the gift itself? There's always a temptation for us to love the gifts more than we love him who is the giver of those gifts. Um, and, um, and that's what makes it so significant that, uh, that, Ab that God commands Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. Here he's literally, he has to choose between God and Isaac, between God and his son. He, he literally has to choose. Um, and um, in this passage of scripture, we're reminded too that um, every day we are called to love God more than anyone and anything else in our lives. Um, that he is to be the, the very top priority in our life, that we are to love nothing and no one, even our own lives, more than we love God. Um, and, and so, you know, as remarkable as it is, you know, we, we think about this as being kind of a one, 
one once one time deal in all of the Bible where God asks um, uh, asks a, a child of God asks one of his children to sacrifice a dearly loved child but in reality this is kind of this is this is really kind of the something that God asks of us each and every day um, that we would love him above all things that we would be willing to sacrifice all things for the sake of of our relationship with him, our relationship with God. That God is to be the one that we love above all things. Even more than our children, our parents, our spouses, even more than our own lives, we are to love God above all things. That's what the first commandment requires, right? That's what the, the first commandment is really all about, is um, loving God above all things. And then number 12, and this is kind of a, uh, a bigger question, this, this kind of whole, this whole story about sacrificing Isaac. So throughout our study of the life of Abraham, we've emphasized how God trained him to walk by faith and not by sight. Second Corinthians 5 verse 7, um, what I think is one of the most important passages in the Bible. That as New Testament Christians, we walk by faith and not by sight. Um, how is that theme emphasized again in this account? And what lessons about being tested by God can we learn from this account? So, um, so again, uh, Abraham was being asked to walk by faith and not by sight. What God, what he saw, what you know, what was um, visible or evident was was God giving a strange command. God giving a command to sacrifice his son. Um, but Abraham was to walk by faith and, and see the greater test that lay beneath that, the test that he was to love God above all things, even more than his son Isaac. I mean, what lessons do, about being tested by God can we learn from this account where we, we, we too, um, difficulty and hardship, it may, God is going to allow difficulty and hardship to come into our lives. We are going to be tested in our faith. Um, we're, um, there are going to be things that happen to us that, um, that, that happen specifically so that we can show that God is the most important thing to us in our lives, that we are willing to forego or sacrifice um, those things for the sake of our relationship with God, that nothing is more important to us than God is. Um, and, and so we, we walk by faith when it seems like what God is asking for us for, from us or of us is impossible that's when it's especially important to walk by faith and not by sight and so i just think you know when when i think about the the life and the story of abraham as a whole um and and maybe this is you know influenced very heavily by by hebrews chapter 11 but when i think about um the the story of abraham as a whole going all the way back to chapter 12 and being um you know called to walk to, to go to this land that that he would um, that God would show him and and you've got the the failures with with um, Pharaoh and with Abimelech and with Hagar and Ishmael and you've got the great successes of recapturing Lot and the um, and the intercession before Sodom and Gomorrah and, and all those things you know all the ups and downs of Abraham's faith all the ups and downs of Abraham's life makes him such a beautiful character for us to study um, because it teaches us to rely on the promises of God. Um, it teaches us to stay focused on the Messiah. And that was what made um, all of this possible for Abraham is that he was staying focused on the messianic promise that through him all the nations of the earth would be blessed. Um, and um, and we have that same Messiah in Christ Jesus. Okay. So um, I hope you have enjoyed, I, I've enjoyed teaching this um, class on Abraham. I hope you've enjoyed kind of going through Abraham's life and, um, and gleaning from his experience um, lessons for our own lives of faith. Um, I have uh, been very thankful for the opportunity uh, for over a year now, you know, almost a year and a half, really, year and a quarter. Um, to be working with you on these Tuesday mornings online, but I'm also very much looking forward to getting back in person so that I'm not just 
talking into a TV screen or a computer screen for an hour um, every Tuesday morning. I'm looking forward to having the chance to interact with you again um, and to be able to ask questions and have you answer those questions and vice versa, have you ask questions that come up about the text. This will be our last Tuesday morning Bible class for the rest of the summer. Um, we'll start back after school begins, um, starts back after Labor Day. Um, we'll start back Tuesday morning downstairs in the in the basement at the Menominee Falls campus um, on Tuesday mornings at 10.15. I haven't necessarily chosen a topic for what we'll talk about next, so I'm open to suggestions. If you have a topic in mind or a book of the Bible that you'd like to study or a, a biblical topic or maybe some um, biblical doctrine or something like that that you'd like to, to study, um, go ahead and feel free to send me a, send me an email or give me a call or shoot me a text or something with that suggestion. I'll certainly take that under advisement. Um, but thank you very much for, for joining us today and throughout um, our Tuesday morning Bible classes here at Bethlehem Online. I look forward to starting again in person following Labor Day. But let's close with a blessing. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with us always. Amen. Thank you very much, and God's blessings to you in Christ Jesus.